today's colloquium. Our speaker today will be Tiago Tomei. Right? He's from the house, a professor here at IFT. And he graduated in USP, then did his uh, PhD here at IFT, spent some time as a postdoc in CERN, right? then come back and post they did some postdocs here too. Right? And he's a member since 2016. 2016 of the CMS uh, collaboration. We'll talk today uh, about the uh, search for dark matter. So go ahead, Tiago. So thanks, everybody. Can you hear me well? OK, so first, thanks, everybody, for coming to the colloquium. <clears throat> uh, as Ricardo had said, uh, I'm an experimentalist, right? So this is not your usual dark matter talk. So I'm going to spend very little time on the things that you know about, namely, oh, the evidence for dark matter and the models, so on and so forth. And I'm going to try to know some things that, uh, again, are bread and butter of my daily work, but I hope that will be new and interesting for you since most of you are theoreticians. So I'm going to talk about searching for dark matter at the LHC. I have to make a very small introduction to dark matter, but this will be only three slides, I promise, and then I'll cut to the chase. So what is dark matter? The answer is simple, right? Nobody knows. What we have is a lot of gravitational phenomena which seem to be consistent and seem to be pointing at the fact that there is something, some kind of mass missing. And you can see this at many different scales. You can see this at the scale of galaxies, like galaxy rotation curves, of galaxy clusters. You can see effects like gravitational lensing. You can see effects on the formation of structures. And pay attention, all of these are very different scales. So it is kind of a leap of faith to say, oh, all of these gravitational phenomena are actually caused by the same source. However, it is fairly consistent that in all of these cases, the amount of, and let's call it already, dark matter that is needed seems to be always more or less the same with respect to the quote unquote, inventory of the universe. So I'm going to make two assumptions here. First, all of these phenomena come from the same source. And second, all of these phenomena are caused by the existence of a hitherto undiscovered particle. Tiago, why do you make this second assumption? Because I'm a particle physicist. If it's something else, it's somebody else's job, not mine. So I have to do this. So if we assume that this is supposed to be a particle, then we're going to call this the dark matter candidate, and it should have some gross features. First, it is, we only detected up until now from gravitational effects. So this means that it has to be dark. What does, what does it mean, dark? At some level, it has, to mean, it has to mean that it doesn't interact with light, so it has to be electrically neutral. But of course, when the rubber hits the road, that means that you have to put some limits on its charge, on its magnetic momentum, so on electric dipole and magnetic dipole momentum. It also is collisionless with itself in the sense that it's self-interaction, and then it should be very small, so in that sense, there is a limit on, its, on the ratio of its self-interaction and its mass. It has to be confined, at least on the kiloparsec scale, or else it cannot, it cannot answer for the phenomena that we're trying to make it. And this will translate then, if you go through the many particle, many particle formalism, this translates into bounds. And in the same way, if you wanted to bring stability, if you want to bring stability to bound systems, again, go for galaxies or clusters or galaxies, it also gives a bound on the mass. And last but not least, since it's important for the formation of structures, it has to be stable. But stable comes with some quotes, right? Because it has to be at least long-lived in the sense that it has to have a half-life at least somewhere around the age of the universe. So all of these dark, stable, collisionless, they come with asterisks and caveats. But from my point of view, as an experimentalist, I'm going to search for this kind of particle that is neutral and stable 
and massive, and that's all that I need. Now, I want to hunt for it, right? They use it to be the, the Higgs Hunter's Guide. No, so now here we have the Dark Matter Hunter's Guide. How do we detect dark matter? And then you usually always see this, this diagram here, which is, has baked in the assumption that somehow it has to interact with the standard model particle. And then you have these three ways here, direct detection, indirect detection, and production of collider. Just because one process may be important for some mode of dark matter doesn't mean that all of them will be. So the point is, don't take this sketch too close to your heart. Direct detection means that there is dark matter in the universe, there is dark matter in the galaxy, there is a dark halo around us, there is a dark, the, the, the planet moves, the sun moves, there is a dark wind coming and passing through us all the time. So we should be able to set up a big detector and Again, with very little probability because it doesn't interact electrically, it doesn't interact strongly, definitely. Caveat, of course, but it should be able to interact with our detector. So more or less like we detect neutrinos. So it, inter it scatters with the dark matter, the dark matter particle and the standard model particle, and you detect that recoil. Indirect detection, I'm not going to speak anything about it except for the fact that in some models it could be important that dark matter interacts or annihilates with itself and then you have effects on the particle distribution of standard models from, astro from standard model particles in astrophysical source. And then what I do is that I can produce it at colliders. So I can collide dark uh, standard model particles and get production of dark matter particles. This is what we're trying to do at the LHC. This complementary to the first two and also has a rich phenomenology because there is a plethora of models that I can use to try to model this. So there is a lot of fun to be, to be had. Direct detection of dark matter is more or less the most kosher way of doing it because there is really dark matter and you want to detect. So let me quickly go through this because it's important to set the stage. How would you do direct detection of dark matter? Let's go with the a canonical experiment. Set up a gigantic detector of noble gas. This has to be dual phase, so liquid in the bottom, gas on the top. Something comes, let's say it's dark matter. It interacts. It's very rare, but every once in a while it interacts. And then it leaves two signals. First is the scintillation light, which is prompt. And then some electrons from this interaction come out and they drift and they finally leave a signal S2 here. From S1 and S2, you have everything because you can have the, diff the time difference, which will give you the Z position. This is a, what's called a time projection chamber. From the shape of the signal of the electrons here, you can have the X and Y position, so you have the 3D position. From the amplitudes, you've got the energy of the interaction. And from the ratio S2 and S1, you can discriminate when the dark matter hit either the nucleus or the electron of the xenon atoms. And this is how these big experiments like xenon, LZ, and uh, panda, yeah, panda work. Now, you may remember that there was some fun last year when there was an unexplained excess for very low energies. These, so all of these events are background. They have a very good background model. And this was in 2020. Now, the, the Xenon experiment up, they upgraded their setup. They now have almost doubled exposure, and the excess is gone. But Tiago, what do you mean? Come on, these guys have been running for much less time. Yes, but remember that what counts is the product of the mass times the running time. And notice here that even with double the data, let's call it double the data, you have much less events on the right plot as opposed to the left plot. Why? Because this is all background. So all that this, that this is saying is that the upgraded experiment is much better. It's much more resistant to background. But looking only at the plots, it seems like the uncertainty is still bigger for the new one, right? The, the relative uncertainty. The error bars are much bigger. 
I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to say anything about that. Just, but just the fact that if, you, if, it, if I was speaking about the LHC, I would say that this is double the running time. But the thing is that this experiment is, mu is much larger. So in the end, OK, maybe, maybe you're right here. But the fact that the, the absolute number here, look, it sublives at 10, while it sublives at 60 here, just means that there is an order of magnitude less background. There is no dark matter. So this electronic recoil, this was on the electronic recoil signal. It was a big hit last year, sorry, 2020. And then it was gone, as is usually the case when you're searching for new physics. So if you do direct detection, what's the current status? You have the three big noble gas experiments. You have Lux, which evolved to LZ, Xenon, and then you have Panda X. And they always carve down this parameter space here, which is here. They suppose it's a weakly interactive massive particle inspired by Suzy. And uh, in this parameter space of the WIMP mass and the WIMP nucleon spin independent cross section. The lower you go down here, the barrier limit is because they're saying that if dark matter exists at this mass, its interaction has to be smaller than this. Currently, the record is the experiment, this paper from July. But notice that there is always this uh, turn, turn up here on the left for smaller wind masses. And this is because very light dark matter particles cannot efficiently interact with your xenon detector. So then you have this whole plethora of, of light, dark mass, light dark matter searches low mass dark matter searches, which have all of these technologies here, which I obviously will not go through because it's a talk, it's a talk about the LHC. But the, all of these experiments are in the running. Now, I'm not going to search for dark matter in the Xeno experiment, or I'm going to search in the LHC. So how do we usually do things in the LHC? If you're searching for new physics, you have to set at, uh, to use at least a benchmark model to have an idea of what you are searching for. So I stole Tim Tice's slide, as everybody does. And the thing is that if you think about new physics models, you can go to one extreme here, where you have just effective field theories, where you just parameterize the thing by putting a constant on the denominator of your Lagrange, new Lagrangian term. Or you can have sketches of models, like these light blue simplified models here, where it's not a real beyond standard model physics model, but it is something that at least has basic ingredients, like a, a new mediator, or, or even the Higgs can play that role, and at, least a new, and at least a new particle. And of course, you can go all the way to UV complete models, and then you have the usual candidates here, and with some tuning the parameters, all of these models can furnish dark matter candidates. Uh, yeah, right. The key thing is, whatever you choose, you have to use this model, either the simplified model or the complete model, and model the dark matter production in the LHC. So what does this mean? This means that you have to, in, in this model, choose, uh, look at the diagrams where you have the production of dark matter, and run the calculations, and run the predictions. Now, there is a, let's, let's focus on some particular benchmark here. Let's say that you want to produce a dark matter pair. Why a pair? Because remember, you want this thing to be stable. So you want it to somehow have some kind of symmetry to stabilize it. And the usual thing is that you have this discrete symmetry where they can only be produced in pairs. So, just like the lightest supersymmetric particle. It cannot decay because it's the lightest and the supersymmetry charge, which I don't even remember the name anymore, is conserved. At LHC energies, the description in terms of the effective field theory is not good anymore because we are at very high energies. So we have to go to simplified models. We have to put explicit mediators, like, the, like a positive Z prime or a scalar, which could be the Higgs. And then you have to couple these mediators to dark matter in parts. And then you draw your diagrams here. Now, remember, dark matter doesn't interact. 
So wait, Thiago, how do you plan on getting, the, on getting this thing in the LHC? And the answer is you don't. You don't see dark matter at the LHC. If you produce dark matter, it will escape unnoticed. So the only chance is for you to actually have it, is for you to have it recoiling against something else. And then you detect that something else, and then you use conservation of momentum to see that something is missing. And this is called a search for transverse momentum imbalance. I'll show you later a diagram. And then you search for whatever is recoiling a gazon. Like, for instance, you, have, you can recoil a gazon a gluon, or a gazon a W, or a gazon a top quark pair. Here, it depends on the model. The sky is the limit. But this is simplified, right? Because you can have all of other models that I'm not going to discuss here, that can also furnish dark matter candidates. But yeah, but then that means it's a zoo, right? No, of course, because we have you people, lots of theoreticians that are helping guide us. So it's a, co it's a joint work in between experimentalists and theoreticians. This, everybody meets in this LHC dark matter working group. They give us guidelines, recommendations. We give them feedback. And they propose uh, simplified models. And how do you do the comparison between the LHC results and the direct indirect detection? This is just propaganda for them. But it's important to have the key point is that you have to have both sides of the aisle working together. The Large Hadron Collider. I obviously don't have to present this. You know that it collides proton-proton at 7. Should be at uh, 14 TV center of mass energy, but right now it's 13.6. And the key thing is that we collide proton bunch at 40 megahertz, 40 million per second. What does this mean? This means that we have approximately 1 billion proton-proton interactions per second. But then if you want to produce a rare particle, like say Higgs boson, or a positive new particle, depending on the cross-sections, which are usually very small, remember, it's dark matter. It's, it usually doesn't interact. It's hard to produce you're looking at one event per second, or even less. So one, one, one interest collision in a, billion, in a trillion is extremely hard to find. Why? Because the cross-section is so slow. Why? It's so low. Why? Because it's hard to produce. It doesn't, it doesn't quite interact. But yeah, but then it's hopeless. How to, how, with extremely low cross-sections, how do you want to produce this thing at the LHC. But, but it can be electroweak It can be. Uh, you're right. It can also be much lower than that, in principle. Yeah, if it's, uh, if it's electroweak, it's fine. <laughs> if it's something mediated by the Higgs, we're in trouble. You're absolutely right, but the key thing is that it is still one in a big number. Why is the cross section is very small here? The Higgs collapses? Because the, the, uh, the, the cross section is small. Sorry, so it's the opposite. If the cross section is small, you have a smaller abundance. If the cross section is large, you have a larger abundance. Okay, okay. But, but the survival is the weakest. That's how to remember. Yeah, but, that, but then the assumption is that the production at the start of you know, the Big Bang is through the same interaction you're doing now, right? Yeah, but it is, right? Uh, if, if, if the particle know. has electroweak quantum number, which is what is, uh, most of the models have for... Yeah, but it's so I, 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 it shouldn't be dominated by the uh, random implied theory of the case. But, but the, in any case, the focus... Okay. But wait, but the focus is that whatever, even if it's electroweak, even if it's mediated by the Higgs, the key thing is that in any case you're being dominated by all the production here, all the QCD, all the minimum bias, all the everything. All that I want to say is that even finding one in one million, if you don't want this 10 to the 13 here, is also hard. And this is the problem that I have to face. Well, yeah, an immense amount of background. I'll get there. Sure, go ahead, but louder because I cannot hear you. What's the difference between 
searching for dark matter in the LHC and searching for anything in the LHC. <laughs> well, anything may be anything, right? I mean... What, what, what is special about dark matter that makes it different? No, it's... No, no. Well, I'll show you. No, let me answer. And stable. And stable. I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll show you. Now, now careful with that. Take that back because uh, my life is harder than that. Uh, so, so I'll show you, I'll show you the difference. But the key thing is that, yes, when you do searches, you do search for whatever. But I'm showing you the particularities of this search. Trust me, it will get there. So, yes, of course, you know that it's the largest accelerator ever. I work in CMS, which unfortunately is on the other side of the ring. So it's far away from where I sit. And the key thing is that, okay, it's hard to produce because it has low cross section. Luckily, the LHC is a beast. It has an amazing luminosity. What does that mean? It means that it produces many proton collisions per second. And how do we manage to do that? The answer is that we managed to squeeze the beams into a very, very tiny region here. And this brings the luminosity up. Imagine if these things are Gaussians in, the, in this plane here. If you bring sigma x and sigma y down, that brings the luminosity up. And then the rate of production of a given kind of process of event per second is the product of the luminosity and the cross-section of the process. So even if the cross-section of production of dark matter is small, then we can just crank the luminosity up and get many events of that. Hooray, we're saved, right? Wrong, <laughs> because if you unwind the calculation, in the end, you divide by the number of bunches and by the revolution frequency. And yes, this is almost engineering, but the key point is that eventually you arrive at the fact that if you want to do that, you will have many simultaneous collisions at the same time. And right now, every time we cross the bunches, we don't have one proton-proton collision, we have 70. But maybe one of them will have, will have the production of dark matter that I want. But the other 69 are just junk and noise in my detector. My detector, what do you say by, what do you mean by that? So we have these beasts, which are general purpose detectors sitting at the high luminosity points of the LHC, which are these, uh, these multi-layer instruments that can detect all the particles produced at the LHC. And uh, I'm not going to go into any detail, but it, they are able to detect everything except, of course, neutral, uh, non strongly interacting particles like neutrinos. Now, now here comes what uh, Nathan said. But wait, what's the difference? The difference is that you want to measure missing energy. So, what's the uh, missing transverse momentum? So, what's the thing? Remember, uh, when you collide protons to collide the particles inside, you have to do the, all the deal with the Bjorkian fraction, right? So, the, the way to do it is that in the transverse plane, you, can, you actually have conservation of momentum. Uh, is actually the total momentum is zero. So what you can do is that you reconstruct all of the particles and you calculate the, the, the magnitude of this vector here. It, it should be zero, right? Because the total momentum in this plane, in the transverse plane, is zero. But of course, nothing is ever so easy. And in fact, this is the hardest thing. And now I'll show you what do I mean by the hardest thing. First, you have to take this data, right? You have the, all of these proton collisions and they leave signals in your detector. And you, want to take, you have to take this data and analyze. Problem, I cannot take all the data because I don't have enough cables, I don't have enough disk, I don't have enough computers to analyze the data, and I don't, definitely don't have enough PhD students to do the job. So I have to throw out 99% and then of the missing 1%, you have to throw out another 99%. We can only save more or less 10 to the minus 4 of all of the data produced because of the engineering constraints. So how do you do? You obviously don't do it randomly. You do some preliminary analysis on the fly and then you search for the missing momentum on the fly and then you just take the events that have that missing momentum. But 
On the fly means that it has to be done online while the data is being taken. So you keep the data in memory in a big computer farm, do the analysis, and then it has to be done quickly. And then you decide if you throw the event in the garbage forever or keep it. But if it has to be done fast, you know how things go, right? Either you do it safely and fast, or you do it quick and dirty. And here we're doing it the quick and dirty way. So we have to pay an efficiency price. What does this mean? This means that if I, let's say that I have, a, uh, that I throw away all events with 200 GV or less of missing ET. That means that, since the calculation was badly done, that means that uh, actually only 50% of the events with that missing ET are actually saved. The efficiency is only 50% here, see? To actually get close to the plateau, which is 90%, you have to go all the way to almost 350. Tiago, you are telling me that you wanted to throw away all of the events with 200 and less, but then you are throwing a reasonable amount of uh, events in this intermediate region away. And to be safe, you should keep only events with 350, yes. But come on, don't be dumb. Why don't you put this cut here, this threshold here, much lower? I can't, because, it, because this is the data taking rate as a function of the pileup. Remember the pileup? So the, the, the data taking rate, it goes faster than linear with the, with the pileup for, the, for events with missing ET. And it, goes, it also goes faster than linear with the threshold. Here, the threshold is 120. If I bring the threshold down to 110, it will be much, much higher, and I cannot take all the data. So I have to put a hard cut, a hard threshold, and even then, I have to go even higher in order to have good efficiency. I cannot take all events with lower, with a low missing ET. But yeah, well then how do you solve this? First, why is that? Because if you look at the spectrum of the missing, of the missing PT, so these are the actual data, these are the actual backgrounds simulated, and the red points here are all of the, are all of the events before cleaning. When you do the cleaning, you get the black points. But if you look here, it's easier to see here, at low, values of missing PT, look at this dark blue histogram. These are events with no real missing PT. This is Z2 electrons. How can they have hundreds, almost uh, hundreds of, uh, almost hundreds of events, events with almost hundreds of uh, missing PT? And the answer is that the resolution is low. Remember, the calculation had to be done fast. So the resolution of the calculation is low. The accuracy is low. And it gets worse. This is the resolution, right? So the lower, the better. It gets worse with the pileup. So you pay the price many, many, many times. Go ahead, Rogério. What is cleaning? So cleaning. So you have a noise. You have dead calorimeter so cells, hot calorimeter cells, noise sensors, noise electronic, non-collision source, beam halo coming on the longitudinal instead of from the collision. Your algorithm went wrong. Your anything, the moon phase was wrong. Who knows? You have to take into effect all of these accounts. You have to, to take into account all of these effects. And then you have to remove events where you detect these this sorts of spurious noise. And then you end up with this clean spectrum here, which actually is described by real collision processes like in the histograms. So this is the problem of searching for dark matter in the LHC. Now assume that you do all of this, fine. Now you just have to search for uh, a, a signal of dark matter in the spectrum of real missing PT, right? Wrong, because even if you have all of these backgrounds of real missing PT, like neutrinos or W2 lap, uh, lepton neutrino, TT bar, you still have to deal with all of the others, like uh, QCD, even after all the cleaning is still here, Z2 lepton lepton, you see this, this gray histogram. All of these contribute to have the total standard model background here that is to be compared, uh, that, that, that is to be compared with the data here. 
And then you do the comparison, and then you do statistics and try to find the, and try to find the deviations. The dominant background is Z, Z to neutrinos. Z into neutrinos followed by W into neutrinos and for some, uh, W to lepton neutrino, and for some reason you miss the lepton. It's hard to miss the lepton, but the cross section of W production is much higher, so the two things more or less compensate. Now you have to simulate all of these things, and remember, then you have to do the simulation of the hard process, which is quote unquote easy because it's fine on diagrams, but you, then you have to do higher order corrections which we just call parton showering. Uh, you have to simulate adronization. Then you have to, to simulate the interaction of all of these things with the, with the detector. Then you have to simulate all of that pile up that I, just throw, that I just showed you. It's an amazing amount of computing power that goes into just making these histograms here, not even talking about the data. Tell me. Because, because usually, if you're searching for, dar for missing transverse momentum, depends on, let's say that you're searching for missing transverse momentum recoiling against a jet. Then there is no lepton if it's real dark matter, right? Because it's only the dark matter and a glue on the other side. There is no lepton, so you veto the leptons. Okay, you veto the leptons to avoid the dark. Exactly, but this depends on what you're searching for. If you're searching for dark matter recoiling a gaze on the W, then it's the other way around. Then you have to search, ask for a, for a lepton. And then you have to find variables that tell you the difference, that, uh, that tell you the difference in between signal and background. Of course, event by event you cannot do, but you should be able to find variables that in average are able to distinguish in between signal and background. Sometimes they're easy, like, oh, if I were searching for uh, dark matter recoiling against a Z boson, come on, don't be dumb, find the Z boson. Then you would just search for, the, for a peak of two leptons in the Z boson. Sometimes, are, sometimes it is harder. In the SUSE searches, some guy much smarter than me invented this race of variables here that are able to distinguish very well in between uh, positive SUS events and uh, standard model background. But then this is the creativity job. Machine learning. Or machine learning, of course, which is obviously the next slide. Sometimes you don't need to do it. Sometimes you just put all variables in your computer, do machine learning and find out the other and find out get a classificator which tells you, oh, is this background, is this signal? There are two things here. First, of course, you have to trust and you have to validate somehow. But when you can, class, you can use machine learning to classify, for instance, in between signal and background, or you can do machine learning as kind of a fit in order to do the regression, for instance. I don't know the real value of the missing ET. I can do the approximation of summing everything, but I can do the regression to go back and try to find the real value. So machine learning can help on both sides. Uh, of course, in any case, you always want to have a backup analysis, which is not machine learning, but just making a set of cuts, thresholds. I want missing PT above so much, a jet with these characteristics, so on and so forth. But then you have to be careful, because if you design these things haphazardly, that means that you may introduce bias into your analysis. And if you introduce bias into your analysis, the statistical part dies. So there are two things that you have to do. First, when you design your analysis, you cannot look at the data. You are blind. You know, just like in the vaccine trials, but the vaccine trials, they have to be double blind. We can be only blind because the protons are not conscious, so it's fine. And you have to optimize your analysis, optimize all of the thresholds that you use to, do, to, to try to separate signal and background. And only after you freeze the analysis, you open the box, you look at the data. Of course, there is a trade-off, right? Because every time that you do uh, an additional requirement, it introduces a systematic effect. And then you have to quantify the systematic uncertainties, the bane of every experimental physicist ever. So 
In practice, for instance, for a monojet search, you want a jet and nothing else on the vent, which could come from a diagram that has a gloom and dark matter, a pair of dark matter on the other side. Uh, this is just a detail I'm going to skip. And then you have to do the data background comparison, where you look at the data, you look at the background, you do the statistics, you have to do what's called a uh, Wait a second. Uh, no, it's not profile likelihood, the word I'm searching for. It's, uh, it's not a challenge. You have, to do, you have to do the comparison. You have to see if you can exclude the new hypothesis. In, in our case, the new, uh, hypothesis test. You have to do the hypothesis test with the new hypothesis being there is only standard model and the alternative hypothesis being there is, uh, there is dark matter present in this sample. Then you have to take, then you have to do, take, take some care, do the profile likelihood ratio, and do the, file, the nice statistics. There is a lot of uh, problems with uh, frequencies, Bayesian statistics, how to treat the nuisance parameters. I'm not a statistician, but in the LHC, we have decided to follow this, uh, this uh, well based recipes from, uh, from the, CLS, call it the CLS criterion, which we have real statisticians blessing and saying that it's fine for our, for our case. And then you do the hypothesis test. You fail. To, you do not find dark matter. What you do is that you invert the hypothesis test, and you calculate excluded regions. So you say, oh, for this mass of dark matter and this um, Value of the coupling, did you exclude dark matter? Uh, yes. And then you go and exclude that point in the parameter space, let's say. Here the, I'm putting the parameter space, the mass of the mediator versus the mass of the dark matter. So you go point by point and exclude all of these regions here. For this particular, path, for this particular plot, you just fix the couplings of the dark matter to the, to the quarks and sorry, the, the mediator to the quarks and to the dark matter. But you can choose what parameters you, you, are going to, you are going to scan. And if you want to compare with the direct detection uh, experiments, what we usually do is a scan on the dark matter mass versus the spin-dependent or spin-dependent nucleon cross-section. Do you have to make an assumption about the mediator? Of course, you have to make an assumption about the mediator. And what's usually done here is to cook this assumption inside this, uh, this uh, cross-section here. So you, you have to do all of these assumptions here. You have to, ma to make sure that the shapes do not depend much on the couplings, that the chosen values are allow the narrow mediator, and that the measure, how, the, how these, how these uh, cross-section here changes the value of the mediator mass. Because this is a model independent. Many, many quotes. Because you can have a supersymmetric model, then you can be more specific. The idea, if you go back to Tim Tate's slide, is that the simplified models, they should be still general enough such that they can represent a whole plethora of other more complete models. Yes, yes, these are simplified models. I, if I didn't say that, I'm sorry, but I'm always talking about simplified models. So that's the plan. Now I have 15 minutes, and I just want to show you what actually happens. So let's start with the monojet search, right? If it's a monojet search, that means that you have, uh, you have a mediator that couples to quarks or gluons in the initial state of the of the collision, and it, it, the mediator has to decay to dark matter. But you cannot see the dark matter, so you have to have something else. What's the easiest something else? It's a gloom being radiated or a quark escaping from the initial, from the, from the initial state of the hard interaction. So the monojet search is the canonical dark matter search in LHC. So what do you do? You ask for high missing PT, and this is why it has to be high, because remember, there is an efficiency, and we want to be in the plateau of the efficiency. You categorize the jet depending on some characteristics, and the key thing here is that 
in this analysis, we not only search for initial state gluon radiation or an extra quark, but you can also search for initial state W or Z radiation and have the W decaying hadronically, W or Z decaying hadronically. But Tiago, yeah, come on, that's super. Well, what do you gain by this? If you have the W coming out with enough PT, you have that phenomena where the two quarks merge, the two quarks are very close together, and then you have those so-called jets with substructure. And that's here what I mean by V tagged and AK8 jet. It's a jet with substructure. You have some extra cuts to kill all the QCD because the missing PT from QCD is always from mismeasurements. And you do, you do some control regions to make sure that your cuts are right. And you have good agreement in between the standard model prediction. So here are the points. I know it's small, sorry. And the, sorry, the standard model prediction are the solid histograms and the observer data are the points. You, you can see here the ratio. So you do the hypothesis test. You find if you had dark matter, you would see a disagreement here. You have these dashed histograms here that would be, that would appear as an excess here. You don't see. So you do the exclusion, you do the hypothesis test, you exclude the dark matter hypothesis, and you invert the, you invert the, the hypothesis test to get an exclusion limit. And that's what is done here, and we scan at all of these points. So in CMS for this particular class of axial vector mediators, you exclude mediators almost above, uh, under 2 TV for any, for a value of very small mass of the dark matter. And if the mediator is to the scalar, it has to be heavier than almost half a TV, again, for very small dark matter masses here. I'm talking about these limits here. See these vertical ones. And then you go back, and you compare with the direct detection. So you have here the limits from Lux, Panda, and Zeno. And here you have the CMS uh, in red, you have the CMS limit. You see here that their limits are much better than ours for this heavy dark matter. Heavy me here means above 10 GeV. But as I said before, for very light dark matter, it cannot, re it, it cannot recoil the xenon anymore. So here we win for very low mass. But the key thing is that this is the spin-independent cross-section, which means vector mediator. That's why I'm talking about the axial vector mediator, which, again, we don't know. We have no idea what the, mo what the real model for dark matter is. So if you go into axial vector, then you have other experiments that are playing the game because Zeno and friends are not competitive here, as far as I understand. So you have Pico and Picasso, and our limits are much, much, much better than theirs. And then, of course, there is an atlas result as well. Of course, here I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody except myself. But I always urge people to look at the results of the two experiments. And then you play the game. So you can search for photo, you can search for jet and mucinity, but you can also have initial photon radiation. So let's go for the monophoton search. And then the game is more or less the same. But you always ask for mucinity. And you, in the, if you are asking for a photon, you ask for a photon with high energy. And again, some quality cuts here. You again veto leptons, because if it's a real dark matter event, you're not supposed to have any leptons. And uh, you, can, you can see here again that the data and the standard model prediction agree essentially perfect. You see here. You see here, Rogério and Ricardo, that you asked, that in this particular case, the background is Z gamma, with the Z decaying to neutrino. So different final state, different background. And again, Atlas plays the same game. And they exclude dark matter candidates up to a couple hundred uh, GV for axial vector, or uh, for very low dark matter, sorry. Mediator up to 1,300, and dark matter masses are a couple hundred here. And then you have the equivalent CMS result. 
And then you open the barn, right? Because depending on the model, dark matter can, go, can recoil against anything. So you have the mono Z search, where you have a Z plus dark matter in the, in the final state. And then obviously you are not going to be crazy. You are going to ask for the Z to decay into leptons. So you ask for a Z boson, mass of the Z boson, high PT, and at least a bit of a missing PT. Here you can set the missing PT lower because you don't have to trigger. You don't have to acquire the data just looking at the missing PT. You obviously look at the Z, at the Z boson. And here you see there are different uh, signal categories. And of course, the main background here is Z, Z, double Z production with one Z decaying to neutrinos and one Z decaying to leptons. Again, perfect agreement. Again, set limits just like we usually do. And then there is again uh, limits around 870 GZ for the mediator mass, and there is an equivalent atlas result. Monotop, see why I said that this is fun? Because there is a lot of different things that you can do. Now you're searching for a top quark plus missing ET. So you ask, what's a top? You search for a top by searching for one or two leptons, depending on the depending on uh, if you are recoiling against a single top or a TT bar pair, jets, B jets, missing PT, and do the comparison. And again, you find out here that the biggest background in orange here is naturally TT bar production. Why? Because TT bar already has missing ET. So TT bar by itself can mimic a TT bar plus missing ET, missing ET signal. Again, you play the game, you find nothing, and you put more limits on the, on, the, on the parameter space. You may notice that every once in a while we have a different model. And why is that? Because not only the simplified models, but for some particular signatures, some models are particularly well suited. So for instance, this monotop search, it also, it, it uh, is also very well suited for this doublet Higgs, sorry, two Higgs doublet model plus an extra to the scalar A model that I honestly has, have no idea about anything except what I just told you. But fine, we can, ser we can search for it. And uh, unfortunately, as usual, we don't find it and we exclude the mass of the pseudo scalar less than a couple hundred GVs. And there is also a charged Higgs that comes around here with mass around the 900 GV. Again, not found, and then you have this equivalent CMS result. Yeah. Tell me. So I like this atlas clock better than CMS. And uh, tell me why. Because it has the red line. You know what the red line is? Yes, I know. It's the, it's the expectation over theory. This one, right? What is the theory? No. Uh, it's not what I expected. I was thinking this is the uh, limit of the thermal red. No, 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 no. Sorry, this is, this is divided by the fury. See, the red line here is the fury, is the fury line. So instead of dividing by, instead of putting a limit on the cross section, you put a limit on the cross section divided by theoretical cross section. So over the ratio, the signal is trans. So this is not a simplified model. This particular one is this the two Higgs doublet model plus to the scalar. But they also put limits on, on the simplified model. It's just that I cannot show everything. But you don't have the plot where you have the cross section for the thermal relative? It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> and then, with five minutes, last but not least, remember, yesterday's signal is today background and today's tool. So let's search for dark matter plus a Higgs in the final state. And then you have even more fun because the Higgs, as you know, can decay onto Zs or to Ws or to Taus or to bottoms or to photons. So here the sky is the limit. So this particular paper, and this one's ours, is called the combination of the five Higgs channels. All decay, so this one was WWZZ, but they did the combination of the others and searching for dark matter plus Higgs. 
And this, besides the simplified model, there were also a Z prime to two Higgs doublet model and something called the baryonic Z prime. And obviously they are searching on, oh, not overly, sorry, but they are searching on the, w, on the fully leptonic, sorry, semi leptonic and fully leptonic channels. They use machine learning. They fit a, a BDT discriminant for the WW because it's harder. In ZZ, it's so easy that they simply fit the PT mid spectrum. Again, no, devi no deviations whatsoever. So we again proceed to set the limits on the parameter space and then also cast on the, on the cross section and versus mass of the dark matter plane. And then you have the usual limits here. Now, this is what you wanted, right, Rogério? You want this line here, right? So if you put all of the results together, you have this, this amazing plot, both from Atlas and CMS, where you have all of the exclusions from all of the different experiments, from all of the different analyses. And here, we can really see the complementarity between collider and direct and indirect detection because you can, okay, lo lovely, I didn't put, the, I don't have them in this particular version of the plot, but you can also put the limits from the direct detection and direct detection here. And here is what Roger was talking about. If you, if you set the abundance to be that of the thermal relic, so this omega h square equals to 0 0.12, you see that not all of these parameter space is actually allowed, but only this line here of the thermal relic. Because this, for the simplified model, this is the line where the simplified model would explain all of the dark matter. So we put it here and make, uh, and make Roger and the others happy. But again, I'm an experimentalist. I cannot just uh, take this as a given. So I have to explore the whole parameter space. And I have shown you everything that we have from run two. We're still finishing some last analysis, but of course, there is always a lot of more work to be done. But then the story doesn't end, right? Run three has only begun. It will bring another 150 investment to barn. It will double the data that we have right now. And then we have the upgrade that will start in 2026. And the, the data taking will start in 2029, and it will go 11 more years until 2040, and that will give us another order of magnitude going all the way to 3,000 inverse Fentobarn. So right now, the LSC has taken only 5% of its total data set. So there is still a lot of work to be done. And uh, that's the end. Thank you very much for your attention, and we can discuss more. Questions? I have one on the very last slide. Is it 3,000 or 4,000? Everywhere you hear different numbers, and you even have both there. You know, uh, making predictions is hard. About the future is even harder. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I understand that we can go to 4,000 inverse Fentobar if we go all the way to pile up 200. But this still has not been set in stone. So I always say the safest number. But yeah, there are plans to go to 4,000 with this caveat here. I have just a question about the likelihood that you use. Mm. For the covariance matrix, do you assume diagonal covariance matrix or correlations among different beings? No, correlations, definitely. So is this publicly available or not? Depends on the goodwill of the person doing the analysis. It should always be public available. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. I have another one. No. I is, have is one. Wait, Nathan, did I answer your question about why dark matter is different? Sector of CERN says, I'm looking for dark matter, another sector says, I'm looking for, I don't know, Higgs doublet, and another one looking for 
supersymmetric particles, is everybody looking for MBT? So uh, I, I, can give you the, I can give you those numbers. First, of course, it's experiment by experiment, right? So what part of CMS is doing dark matter? I would say something around 100 people out of 3,000. But then the SUSY group that searches for other SUSY signatures, yes, there is overlap. But sometimes it's the same people just doing different interpretations. There is overlap and the people talk. So it's not like... Yes, no, definitely, there are groups. There is a whole hierarchy of groups. And, but the thing is that these people talk and the methods go from one to the other. Everything that we do here to search for these Higgs here, we crib it from the Higgs people. And kind of on that point too, correct me if I'm wrong, right? If you detect, let's say tomorrow you find a heavy neutral particle that is long-lived enough to escape the detector, right? Mm. You're still missing a piece to be able to say this is dark matter, right? Uh, some pieces, but mainly how long-lived it is, right? You have just a lower limit, right? And you, would, you will have found with those searches just a neutral, fairly long-lived particle, but you don't know if it's uh, uh, cosmological scale long-lived. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But then, with the, let's say we find it, fine. We will find it on some channel. Then you can go back and see which models give that, for instance. So we found it together with the top quark. So third generation is special. So let's search for new physics uh, with third generation that maybe have nothing to do with dark matter. And then we go back to the... To the direct and indirect detections and tell you, listen, this model predicts such and such thing. There are, there are synergies. But you're right, by ourselves we cannot say, oh, we have found dark matter. We can find strong evidence, but... Also, how, how strong are the limits for dark matter that is not producing these mono-something signals? Ah. Well, because there are, there, I mean, long decay uh, chains, for instance, in SUSY. Yeah, that's what I tried to say here in the beginning. So, uh, right? There is all of these cascade decays, and there are searches with long-lived particles. But just a curiosity, do you know if the limits are stronger or weaker in those other signals? I know that they are generally weaker. Okay. okay. But that, 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 that's the thing. Everybody who was doing through these searches with uh, the neutralino and stuff, has kind of migrated to dark matter. Because they, we, it's easy to recast. It's easy to, uh, to, do, to recast these results into this result. So this result... Yeah, but, I, but I think the limits you're getting from these mono-something signals do not apply to long decay chains at all, right? Because then you have, you have this... The, basically, the Z2 does not demand that you produce two dark matter particles. It would be one dark matter and some other SUSY particle that compensates this, the, the R parity and is charged, -party, you know. Yeah. So in the end, you can, you can have signals that are very different from mono something. Right? Correct, absolutely correct. Okay, any other questions? No, let's thank Tiago again. And we have coffee break in the usual place.